<laughs> no, I think you've got them all. And before that, he had been uh, chairman of the Republican National Committee. And it's true, you had, uh, you started on Capitol Hill in a very unusual way. I was a uh, Senate parking lot attendant. I parked cars for the uh, Senate staff. Honest was, work uh, on Capitol Hill. <laughs> and uh, then that led to an internship. I also, my first job at the uh, RNC was I was a phoner in the basement in one of those little cubicles. I would call people at home and bother them for money for the Republican Party. And 18 years later, I was chairman in the, on the top floor <laughs> calling people at home and bothering for money for the Republican Party. So it was a good experience. Uh, were you good at it? I was pretty good at it, yeah. Like, what was the typical ask in those days? Oh, in those days, it was, uh, you know, to make sure that we got more Republicans to help support uh, President Reagan's agenda. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, the, the nature of it doesn't really change. I, I will say that I, uh, over time, tacked on more zeros, uh, which was good uh, in the ask. So what's a typical ask for you these days? Uh, it varies. There's no such thing as a typical ask these days. But uh, I'm asking quite a bit for trying to help the Republican State Leadership Committee to uh, elect state, House, and Senate candidates around the country, which I think is very important. And also so, reaching down governor, uh, attorney general. Attorney general. The RGA, you know, the governors are, are pretty well covered. Governor Barber's, you know, done a fantastic job at the RGA and the folks there. The Republican State Leadership Committee has uh, everything down ballot uh, in the state elections, essentially, from lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and state, House, and Senate candidates. And it's a very good year out there for uh, all you know, for us for that, too. Okay, and then let's real quick walk through your yeah. other hats. You're a founder of Resurgent Republic. Correct, which is uh, a center-right uh, organization that was modeled directly on Democracy Corps uh, that uh, James Carville and Stan Greenberg had set up on the left. Does a, they have done a very good job for a decade now of gauging public perceptions and public opinion relative to the, to the policy debate going on in Washington and around the country. And I thought, you know, we need to learn to take a page from their playbook and uh, uh, set that up along with a number of other uh, uh, folks. Whit Ayers, a, a very good pollster in the party, as well as a number of other pollsters uh, on the uh, conservative side. Uh, so you take polls and then what do you do with them? We uh, uh, analyze them. Everything, every uh, question we ask, we make public, put it on uh, resurgentrepublic.com and, and uh, make all the uh, findings available on the internet and we do an analysis of uh, what we're seeing. We're, uh, Resurgent Republic was really the first to spot the move away from President Obama by independent voters. Uh, that was really back in April of last year. Uh, Gallup picked it up in June. Uh, but we've been tracking those independent voters over the course of the past, uh, since, since Resurgent Republic launched last April. Okay, and then a third big hat is your role in helping to start American Action Network, American Crossroads. Could you just explain those and your role in them? Well, I don't want to overstate it because uh, other folks have done a lot more than I have in that regard. American Action Network uh, was started by, uh, by Norm Coleman and Fred Malik and others, and they do a fantastic job uh, there. Rob Collins runs it. Uh, Doug Holtekin does the American Action Forum, and that's modeled largely on Center for American Progress, uh, which has been very effective, again, on the left uh, in helping to you know, formulate ideas and promote ideas uh, from, a, from a more liberal side of the equation. Uh, this does it from the more conservative side of the equation. And then uh, uh, the uh, American Crossroads and American Crossroads GPS uh, is a group that uh, I helped to launch along with Carl Rove to offset uh, much of the activity on the left by, you know, moveon.org, moving America forward, AFL-CIO, SEIU, to try to uh, compete in the, uh, in the political arena uh, in a way that on the, on the right we really haven't. Uh, for uh, since McCain-Feingold. Now, what gave you the idea of trying to build a network like this to duplicate what Democrats successfully did while they were out of power? What Democrats successfully did while they were out of power <laughs> was, you know, they were very good at, uh, at adapting to, uh, to McCain-Feingold and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of bringing together some institutions that, uh, you know, helped them become more competitive uh, over time and, and reinvigorated them. And I thought, uh, you know, with us losing control of the, the House, the Senate, and the White House, that it was, a, it was time for uh, conservatives and Republicans to take a look at that infrastructure that the left had assembled over the uh, course of, uh, of time and see if there were some things they were doing that we ought to be doing and we're not. Uh, and some of the things we just talked about were, uh, are a number of those. Okay. All right. We know your hats now. Let's take a little <laughs> tour of the landscape. Let's start out. How bullish are you about Republicans' chances on November 2nd? Very. Uh, and it, it's hard to see, you know, with... with uh, you know, just a little over a month to go, how, how the dynamic can really change in any significant manner. Uh, but as I've been traveling the country and, and talking to uh, state House and state Senate candidates and really seeing the ground game that's going on out there, the energy is really strong on the Republican side. And, uh, 
you know, I said this and I, was, I volunteered as uh, general chairman for Bob McDonald's campaign for governor of Virginia and I was saying back in, in uh, you know, 2009, the most dangerous place to be in Virginia on election day is between a Republican and a, and a voting booth and that's gonna be the case uh, this November, the most dangerous place to be on election day is between a Republican and a, and a voting booth. Our folks are very fired up, very energized, and coming in. Those independents that we just talked about, uh, they're going to be there in big numbers as well, and they're going to vote to uh, try to put a check on uh, President Obama and this administration and, uh, and to make changes to the uh, Pelosi-Reed Congress. Okay. Now, Republicans would need 10 seats to take the Senate. What do you think is the range of what's possible on your side? Uh, I think we're at six to eight, and uh, but I also think it's an election day where who knows, uh, you know, uh, what's going to happen at the end of the day. There's, uh, I don't think there's any. So you're skeptical of the idea that Republicans would take the Senate. I don't envision Republicans taking the Senate right now, but I don't rule it out. Uh, I think that this is uh, an environment, and I don't think there's any such thing as a as a safe Democratic seat. I think we're seeing that right now in in uh, West Virginia, among other places maybe even New York. I mean, I think there's a lot going on on the ground right now. That it would, I would not be surprised to uh, see Republicans uh, in control of the Senate. On. Okay, so what are your 9, 10, 11, 12? What, what are the ones that look out of reach that you could imagine coming in reach? Well, I mean, I, I don't think that, first of all, I start with, a, uh, I'm, I believe we will hold all of our opens, uh, and then I think we're going to uh, pick up a number of of Democratic opens uh, as well, uh, certainly North Dakota, uh, uh, Ohio, well, sorry, that's one of our opens, I'm sorry. But uh, when you look around at some of the other uh, seats that I think are in play today that maybe, you know, six months ago people wouldn't say, well, we, you know, Republicans may be able to win on Election Day. Obviously, uh, California, Wisconsin, uh, uh, Connecticut, uh, West Virginia, all, you know, very much. Uh, uh, I'm sure I'm leaving folks out right now, but uh, I think there's a very good chance that, uh, that we could be at eight or nine. So are we going to start to see Republican money moving from, to West Virginia, moving to Connecticut? Well, I, some, I, I read somewhere that uh, the Senatorial Committee had put down a buy-in uh, in West Virginia, so I think you're already starting to see that. So are you, is your organization starting to look at uh, broadening the field? Well, again, my, just to be clear, my organization is the Republican State Leadership Committee. We're broadening the field all over the place in terms of the State House and Senate races. I think we're going to win probably, we're going to net 10 legislative chambers around the country, heavily concentrated in the in the Great Lakes, and that's very important to us in terms of redistricting, as you know. So any gains that we make in the U.S. House uh, in this election, we haven't talked about the U.S. House, I think we're going to win the U.S. House, uh, we'll be able to have a pretty big impact in, in uh, redistricting in a way that helps protect the gains that we make in, uh, in this election in, in uh, 2010. Okay, now let's set the scene on redistricting. How many state houses, how many chambers do Republicans hold now? Uh, oh, that's a that's a trick question, Mike. I, I should know that, and I don't. Uh, but I know that. But what does the net ten do for you? Talk talk about what the impact of that would be. Well, the net ten uh, would be. Uh, I'm if you look at someone where like uh, again talking about the Great Lakes, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, maybe even Illinois. We could win the state houses uh, in all of those states. The Wisconsin uh, state senate, we could win. And in, in the New York State Senate, uh, if you look at New York, we could win, you know, six to eight U.S. House seats in New York, depending on what kind of a night it is. Pennsylvania, three or four. Ohio, three or four. Indiana, three or four. Uh, so having control of the state houses and the redistricting process in, in those states would be pretty important to keeping those. Now, we talk about the redistricting process, and that sounds a little abstract. What, in very, like, specific mechanical terms, can you do if you control a state house when you go to draw these maps? Well, the, the, there's redistricting com committees uh, in most of the uh, state legislators. There are some places where there's redistricting done by commission. Uh, some places the governor has a veto authority, some they don't. But in most states, the uh, congressional district lines, as well as the state house and the state senate lines, are drawn by the state legislators. And uh, having the, uh, the pen in your hand, by, because you have the majority, being the chairman of that committee, uh, makes a big difference. And so uh, in these states that we're talking about, uh, being able to draw the district lines in a way that uh, is, is you know, more favorable toward your party, which is done on both sides of the aisle, uh, can have a, an impact for uh, five election cycles for a decade. And Ed, how much money do you expect the Republican State Leadership Committee will spend this cycle? Uh, I think this, uh, probably for this cycle, we'll probably do around 30 million. I think, you know, probably spend somewhere between uh, 15 to 18 million dollars from Labor Day through, uh, through Election Day. And what was it in the 08 cycle? Probably about 22, so about a 50 percent uh, increase. And is there an equivalent organization on the Democratic side? There's a Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, uh, which is responsible for their uh, state house and senate. RSLC also houses, the, we have the Republican Attorney General Association 
Secretary of State Association, uh, as well as the uh, Republican Legislative Campaign Committee. You have quite an empire. On their side, they're, uh, they're broken up a little bit more, and they have different, you know, we're, as I say, we have a, we have, have a mall uh, uh, here where, you know, RAGA and, and uh, the RLCC and Secretary of State Association uh, all are kind of housed. And in your spare time, you do the Catholic University Board, you say? And I'm, I've just ducked out of a Catholic University of America Board of Trustees meeting where I serve on the Board of Trustees uh, at my alma mater, and, uh, but uh, wanted to come and spend a little time with you. Okay, <laughs> as we end the landscape here, uh, let's talk about the House. You said that you win the House. You would need uh, 39 pickups. Uh, what do you expect? I think we're uh, looking at 45 uh, and north of 45, uh, depending on you know, how much things continue to build between now and, uh, and November. Uh, but I would say, you know, a, a minimum of a 45 seat pickup. Okay, north of 45, what's the ceiling? You know, once you get north of 45, it's hard to say. I mean, it's a, it's a dam break at that point. And, uh, uh, and, know, and do you foresee a potential dam break on November 2nd and coming up to it? Yeah, I think, there, I think so. I mean, you, you just look at the, you know, all of a sudden, you know, seats that are coming into play that I think people weren't, you know, necessarily counting on being in play. And uh, like I say, there's, you know, uh, I don't think there's any such thing as a safe uh, Democrat today. So, uh, you know, in any election, I remember working for, for Haley Barber uh, in, in after the uh, 94 cycle, and, and uh, he would talk about Congressman Flotsam and Congressman Jetsam who washed up in the, you know, in the tidal wave, and I suspect we'll see a few of those uh, the, the Wednesday uh, after the election in November. Okay. Now, Ed, YouTube and Politico took questions online through Google Moderator. I have one of those questions here. This is from Duke Winner 123 in New York. Um, uh, the question is, the boundless expansion of online communications has caused media to generally become more partisan toward the left or the right. How has media partisanship affected midterm races this year, and what effects can we expect between now and November 2nd? Well, it's kind of interesting. You know, uh, the, the media, uh, the media writ large, uh, does go through cycles. There was a, you know, a time in, uh, in our history when you know, the newspapers, the major dailies picked a side and you had the Waterbury Republican and the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and everybody knew. Uh, and, then, and then it became part of the ethos that well, journalists are gonna be subjective and not, you know, pick a side. You can argue how effective they were at that one way or the other. Uh, but uh, I think it's pretty clear now that folks are certainly on, in the online community. Uh, you know, people are picking a side and, they're, and, and voters, I think, have access to obviously a lot of information. Voters are smart. I, I, you know, put a lot of faith in them. They filter out, uh, you know, bad information. They go to places even if they know that there has, you know, there's a certain ideological slant to it. I like, I'm sure everyone else here, I go check out, you know, a number of websites in the course of a day and in the morning, and they're not all ones that are reinforcing of my uh, point of view. Many of them are, are uh, have a different take, but I like to see what, you know, what's out there. And, uh, you know, there's credible information. There's not credible information. There's information from the left. There's information from the right. And there's not credible information on the left and not credible information on the right and credible, credible information on the left and credible information on, on the right. I think it's been a positive thing uh, in terms of the, uh, generally the political uh, process. I do think it's probably contributed to greater polarization uh, in, the, in the political process. Uh, but, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing either. I mean, there, there, there's a reason there are two parties. People disagree. And uh, I think we can do that civilly. But uh, in terms of the Internet and its impact, uh, I think it's generally been hugely positive and beneficial to, uh, to voters and have given people, uh, you know, greater uh, breadth of information and places to go to get it. And the 2004 presidential election when President Bush was running against uh, Senator Kerry, your side had the technological advantage. Your focus on micro-targeting really put you ahead and later the Democrats copied that. Yeah. In 2008, they seemed to get the upper hand in technology. How did that happen? It's the nature of politics. It, you know, things leapfrog, and uh, and uh, the other side. Uh, you know, you have to adapt and and uh, and react, and and then you move ahead. And we've seen that time and time again in the uh, in the political arena. I think we're seeing it now. I mean, if you you know, we talk a little bit about the some of the groups on the on the right that we talked about. You know, in in uh, 2008, those who supported President Obama in his election. Uh, and down ballot from him, beginning with the Obama campaign through the DNC and to the AFL-CIO and SEIU and other you know uh, liberal leaning organizations, they spent 1.1 billion dollars in uh, in uh, expenditures to help elect President Obama. People who supported his point of view on the on the conservative side, uh, there were there was only 634 million dollars spent by 
the McCain campaign and the RNC and, and, and folks that supported uh, that point of view. So a $500 million gap had, had uh, uh, you know, come about mm -hmm. over three cycles after McCain-Feingold. That's now, you know, that pendulum may be swinging back the other way. So you have to adapt uh, to the changed circumstances or you're not going to, you know, be able to be competitive and be a majority party. So I believe that we are uh, in a position to, uh, to reclaim our majority status, but uh, we need to adapt technologically uh, and, and to the process uh, in order to do that. And, you know, Democrats will respond accordingly. Now, when you look outside the party structure at the money that's going into these elections, there clearly is a lot more on your side this fall than there is on the other side. Why do you think that is? Partly reflects being on the outside, uh, and and that you know we saw that dynamic uh, on the left when President Bush was in the in the White House for eight years. You know, people get the the intensity tends to be on the side on, of the folks who are out. When you're when you're in, uh, you know, there's contentment, and you know, you actually get frustrated with uh, with your own side for not doing the things you think they ought to be doing. And we're seeing that on the left now, uh, but on the on the right, it's a lot easier uh, to be unified as as is the case on the left. It's always easier to be unified in opposition to something uh, than trying to get something done. Okay. We have another question that came in through Google Moderator. This is once again from Gary Kubiak in Chicago, so he wins the uh, prize. He asks, "What effect will John Stewart's rally have on Election Day?" <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I, 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 I don't think uh, a significant effect. Uh, I think that, you know, John Stewart's show. Obviously, people, a lot of people get a lot of information uh, from it, and and uh, but I'm not sure at the end of the day how much of an impact it's going to have. On David election Axelrod day. was on this stage, and he said that on benefit, he believed that it would, uh, that on balance, it would benefit his side because it would get people excited. Again, that's what they need for the reasons you've been talking about. He said the only slight drawback is that it may take people away from uh, working uh, turnout efforts. But he said on balance, it helps them. you agree with that? I'm just not so sure. I, I can understand him thinking that, I mean, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm not so sure it's going to have a, a, a significant impact given the, the dynamics of this election uh, that we're looking at right now. Now, Ed, at this point, what do you worry about? What could go wrong for your side? Well, I worry about uh, intensity waning, although I don't see it. Uh, and, I, and I think, actually, as uh, President Obama and, uh, and the Democrats seem to kind of double down in trying to ener energize uh, core Democratic voters, there's a flip side of that, which is it continues to, to stoke core Republican voters uh, in response to that. So I, I think they, uh, they'll fix that concern on my part uh, themselves. So is the, the President's going out, uh, he's doing some big rallies. He has one uh, tomorrow in Wisconsin where they yep. say he could get five to 10,000 people you believe that's going to help your side? I do. Yeah. I, I, I you know, the, the president, unfortunately, and I, I think, you know, I don't know at what point he changed from, uh, you know, post-partisan to most partisan, but uh, the, the, you know, his, the, I've never seen a president of the United States uh, on either side of the aisle engage in the kind of, uh, you know, personal attacks uh, against uh, uh, people in Congress on the other side of, of the aisle, the way President Obama has chosen to do. I don't think it's. I don't think it's one. I don't think it's good for the presidency. But two, I'm not sure. It's, I don't think it's politically effective for them. Okay. Uh, All right. I if you it, if you were him, if you were his counselor, what would you be advising him? I'd say make you know talk about the issues. Talk about the you know uh, you know what, make a case for your health care bill, uh, make a case for your stimulus plan, uh, and and try to get you know folks to understand that why you think that it's better than the alternative. Uh, but the you know the kind of the personal screeds and attacks against. Uh, against leaders, you know, by name, Republican leaders in Congress. I think, uh, you know, they, it's like nails on a chalkboard to a lot of Republicans, but it also alienates a lot of uh, independent voters. That's that's not changing the tone. I mean, well, it is changing tone. It's making it worse. So uh, I think that that uh, when he goes out there and he stumps, uh, I'm sure it has some short-term energizing effect for uh, core Democratic voters. But I can assure you. It has a very energizing long-term effect on conservatives and, and independents and drives, them, drives independents further into Republican arms. Now, the, the president himself has started talking about the House minority leader, the Republican leader, John Boehner, right. who would be Speaker Boehner if Republicans get the majority. Uh, what do you think was in their mind? What do you think is their strategy with that? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, well, I, I think well, it's... Well, well, what it clearly is, is if you build him up, then you can attack him or take him down, make him the face of the Republican Party. Is that working? I think he ought to send, I think uh, John Boehner ought to send the president a box of chocolates uh, and say thank you uh, because I, I, you know, you helped me buy this box of chocolates as well as a number of other uh, things I was, you know, ads I was able to buy. And, you know, thanks for elevating the minority leader in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, in a way that's never been done before in the history of the republic. 
and thanks for coming on down to my level. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. Other than that, I think when you're, you know, when, when you've got a raging river coming at you, you'll try to grab for any uh, branch to try to pull yourself out of that, uh, you know, being swept away. And uh, I think, near as I can tell, they've pivoted away from that to another strategy. So. Now, the donors to a number of these groups, uh, because of the tax laws under which they're organized, do not have to be disclosed. Uh, David Axelrod uh, said that uh, we should ask you a question, which I can ask you now, and that is that if these people are so uh, invested in the process, like if these groups um, are so valuable uh, to the process, why not disclose who the money comes from? Well, first of all, again, my organization, the Republican State Leadership Committee, we disclose our donors. Uh, it's, a, it's a 527, and we have 85,000 individual donors, and they're happy to be uh, disclosed. But and the big money on the outside, uh, including American Crossroads GPS, does not have to be. Uh, there, there are uh, American Crossroads has a 527 that does disclose. There's a, a C4 that does not disclose, as is the case on the on the left, Center for American Progress, and their ads that they run are you know their donors aren't disclosed, and uh, you know the the bill that uh, Chuck Schumer and and uh, uh, Van Hollen, uh, you know, have introduced, as I understand it, would exempt the AFL-CIO from, from disclosing. But, so, but, but if I'm a voter, yeah. like, don't I want to know who's buying those ads? Well, let me, let me I just, I was just, try, just trying to point out that there are geese and there are ganders. Uh, and, you know, both sides have organizations that disclose and both sides have organizations that don't disclose. Sure. But let, let's and historically, let's on the left, what? they have had a big advantage in those non-disclosed okay. donors. And this changed the cycle, so now we've got to build to try to change it back. Okay. But let's uh, talk about both sides. But, okay. uh, well, let me, but so let me just say, why, why would a donor give and not want to want to be disclosed? Mm -hmm. A couple reasons. One, if you look at the history of uh, donors on the, on the right who have given to uh, certain causes or organizations, they've been subject to, uh, you know, some pretty vicious attacks uh, from uh, the organized left. Uh, there are people who were uh, gave to uh, a, a referendum out in California who were got flooded with emails, pretty nasty in nature, and had their jobs threatened. You saw what happened when Target supported a uh, candidate for governor in uh, Minnesota, and then all of a sudden the organized left uh, went after Target. Uh, and the fact is a lot of these uh, folks who are opposed to more government control of our economy uh, and more government intervention in our economy are already subject to a great deal of government control and government intervention and regulation in the economy, and they're, they're, there's fear of retribution. There's a fear that, well, if I give to this organization and those who are in control and in power and who seek to further uh, government control of my, you know, of my sector or my company or my own personal lives, uh, they'll come after me. Now, that's, you know, I don't think paranoia on their part. You're not really paranoid when they're really out to get you. And uh, the fact is that uh, there are, unfortunately, uh, instances, I mean, we just saw just recently uh, the, the news report of a Democratic member of Congress calling up uh, a company and saying, hey, I noticed that you weren't on my, uh, my donor form. You haven't given any money to me, but I've seen you've given some other members of my committee, and I have a lot of say over the business in your uh, sector. That kind of thing, I know it's shocking, but it happens. And yep. believe me, it happens when you show up as a conservative somewhere. You'll hear from somebody saying, oh, geez, I, I see you don't necessarily agree with uh, my agenda. Uh, maybe I'm going to have to change the nature of the way your business is regulated. Okay, but just talk about these big undisclosed checks. Do you wonder, do you worry that this could get out of hand, that something could happen that in retrospect will say, okay, that was corrupt? Well, I guess uh, there's always that possibility and, and uh, the media, I'm sure, would do a very good job of scrutinizing both sides on the left and the right. You're part like when the 500, billion, it, 500 million dollar window opened up between the left and the right and, and uh, there wasn't much consternation about it at the time, but I'm sure now that the right has even the playing field a little bit, there will be much more uh, interest in this. Uh, on this front, and so so, uh, so, so, do you think that you're being uh, held to a standard that you think is inappropriate? Let me let me posit this. Here's a here's a. Well, I, I think it's a different standard uh, that's applied uh, and, today and what, than and was. And what is the difference? That there are conservative groups now engaged in something that liberal groups have been doing for for three cycles is the difference. And I was I welcome New York Times to uh, your interest in this uh, you know in this area. Uh, but look, there's a flip side by the way in terms of those non-disclosed donors, which is that uh, if you're non-disclosed. And it's not just that you're protected from, you know, being fearful of, of retribution possibly from those who are in control and, uh, you know, don't appreciate you supporting, uh, you know, those who don't share their point of view while they're in power. At the same time, uh, you know, the, the beneficiaries of it uh, don't have any idea uh, who is participating in the process either. So maybe there's a virtue uh, that's not often noted. All right. Uh, we have a question from Google Moderator that came in online. This is from pgun01. And they ask, 
How many of the issues that are big in this campaign were clear back in 08? How many of these issues arose spontaneously? How many of these issues could you see coming? Well, the biggest that was, <coughs> I think, started to become clear in 08 uh, is the economy and the concern over, uh, over jobs and, uh, you know, the, the uh, economic growth of the country and the, and the financial markets. And that's still very, you know, prevalent today. So actually, I think to a, to a large extent, while and, you know, national security was an issue in, in 08, but not nearly as much as it was in, in 06, uh, but clearly uh, from 08 going forward, uh, the economy has been the dominant uh, issue set and remains the most dominant issue set going into this November. And uh, Ariana asked me a question on the way in here. Uh, she wondered if we're now in a cycle where incumbents will never last, that the anger will always be turned into whoever's there. And so if we get a Republican in, like the uh, Tea Party will turn on that. I think, you know, it's hard to extrapolate out from one, one cycle, you know, down the line. Uh, every cycle has its own, uh, you know, attributes. Uh, there's clearly an anti-Washington, uh, anti-establishment uh, uh, strong strain in the electorate right now. I think it's understandable. Uh, I think that accrues to Republican benefit uh, in, a, in a big, big way uh, this year. Uh, but if Republicans, if I'm right and Republicans win control of the House and we're not responsive to, the, to what those voters are looking for in a new Republican majority, uh, we'll be next. And, and there's no doubt, I think, that the, and then this may tie into the earlier question, the previous question about the impact of the new media and the Internet. You know, the cycles have accelerated. These wave elections used to, you know, be every 40 years and every 20 years and every 10 years, and now they're like every four years. And, you know, there's no doubt that that's a, uh, a contributing factor to it. Uh, but I don't, I, I wouldn't project a straight line out from, from this election year and say going forward. I, I think, you know, this administration has been extraordinary in the, uh, you know, breadth and depth of government intervention in our economy, and that's what's really fueled this anti-Washington uh, uh, sentiment out there. And, and so, I, you know, if, if, if that, if the result of that is a change in control of the House and the result of that is that President Obama then moves to the, more to the center in the way uh, Bill Clinton did, uh, after losing the House in 94, that may, you know, that could change the dynamic considerably. Now, if Republicans get the House, as you are predicting here that they will, uh, the Speaker will be John Boehner of Ohio. Now, Leader Boehner's history has not been as a bomb thrower, and yet he's going to have a lot of, like, very aggressive, emboldened members in his caucus. How do you navigate that? Well, he's, uh, he's a very skillful uh, leader, and, and, you know, he's someone I have a lot of respect uh, for and admiration for. Uh, but I don't think you have to be a bomb thrower. He's also a conservative. Uh, you know, this is a guy who's been in Congress for over 20 years and has never sought an earmark for his district, uh, who's got a pretty good record when it comes to taxes and spending and, and uh, fiscal policy as well as life and, and, you know, pretty much, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'd say, you know, John Boehner's ACU rating has to be 90 or north of it. I mean, so he's a, you know, he's a conservative, and that's what, matters most is are you going to adhere to the principles and the policies uh, that we believe in as a party, as a leader of the, uh, of the House Republicans? I believe he will, and I don't think you have to throw bombs to do that. So do you think he should work with the White House? I think where if there are opportunities to work with the White House where, uh, like I say, the president is willing to work in an accommodating fashion with, uh, with, with hopefully Speaker Boehner, which, I, you know, it's hard to think they're going to get off on a great foot, given where the president's, what the president's been saying over the past, you know, few weeks. But well, it's been mutual. Did John Boehner talk to the president of the United States personally? Uh, 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 there have been, been plenty of tough I rhetoric. I if he did. There's been plenty of tough rhetoric about President Obama from your side. Like His policies. I, I, I mean, I, I, think there's a, you know, I think there's a distinction here that's important in the political arena. So all that to say, if there are some areas where there's, uh, you know, chance to work together, for example, in free trade agreements, uh, I think that there would be, you know, that's, that may be an area where uh, a Republican House and a narrowly divided Democratic Senate and, and President Obama uh, could find some, some, you know, common ground and accommodation, maybe even on entitlement reform. If the president were to try to tack back toward the middle a little bit in response to the signal from this election, uh, that would be an area where uh, I think that, that they could find some common ground. So uh, do you think your side would be willing to give some ground on entitlement reforms? For instance, if uh, the president were to accept some clear long-term spending cuts, would your side be willing to accept, accept tax increases? I, I don't think there are many Republicans out there running, running, saying, vote for me and I'll increase taxes if I get to Washington. No, but you, you, were, you, were, you were suggesting that in a governing mode, like they might be able to make some sort of deal. 
Well, what I was suggesting was if you're going to do entitlement reform, uh, look, and I'll, I'll leave this to the policymakers, but uh, to, to me, entitlement reform means getting control of the spending that's going on in Washington. Uh, and I'm not sure that there's a revenue problem right now. I think there's a spending problem right now. But, you know, uh, that, that's a debate to be had for a, if there's a Republican House and a, and a uh, Democratic president, I'm sure. So say that you have a Republican House, Democratic White House, Democratic Senate. What would House Republicans be able to do? Well, again, I think there's uh, trade is an area where you could get some things done. And I think, look, at the end of the day, you have to fund the government. Uh, and, and we saw this with uh, when President Bush, we had a Republican uh, White House and a Democratic Congress. I was there for, uh, you know, negotiating the budget uh, with President Bush and Speaker Pelosi and, uh, and the Democrats on the Senate side. And, uh, you know, we were able to get, uh, you know, accommodation on, on the budget. And nobody got everything they wanted, and, uh, but we were able to, uh, you know, to, to move forward. How aggressive do you think House Republicans, if they become majority, should be on subpoenas on investigating the White House? I don't, you know, I, I don't think that's what people are electing Republicans to do. I think they're electing Republicans to try to put the brakes on uh, spending and, and uh, make sure that we get our fiscal house in order. We don't double the debt over five years and triple it over ten. Uh, but there's obviously a legitimate uh, oversight role for, uh, for uh, the Congress, and it's an important one uh, to ensure that uh, taxpayers' money is being spent properly, that uh, things are being done in a you know, that the, the laws are being implemented as, as Congress passed, and that's uh, certainly a, uh, a legitimate uh, function of the uh, legislative branch. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that Republicans should be too sidetracked by it. I think that the focus needs to be on policy and spending and taxes and getting jobs going in the country again. Now, how much of an opportunity do you think you're, there is for your party in 2012? How vulnerable do you think the president's re-election is? Well, I think he's, he's very vulnerable right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, the... the 2012 is a, is a lifetime away in politics, and that pendulum can swing. I think a lot of it depends on how does he uh, react to uh, the, you know, the, the change dynamic after this election. President Clinton was able to adapt because I think voters saw him as uh, you know, someone who had moved too far left, and he was able to come back to the center as a, you know, because he was a new Democrat and third way. And uh, I'd you know, be interested to see if President Obama can do that because uh, he did not campaign that way, and I'm not sure that's, you know, how he feels about things. Um, but that said, you know, pendulums swing in politics. I, you know, 18 months ago, few people would think that there would be a legitimate discussion here today about the prospect of Speaker Boehner like we just had. Um, so uh, I think that he, uh, right now, I would say he is very vulnerable uh, to, uh, to defeat in 2012. But I would also say uh, it's right now, and that could change. Now, what potential candidates on your side look strong? I think we're going to have a great field. I mean, I'm excited by it. And, I, you know, this is always a, you know, a tough question because you end up, you know, making somebody mad for mentioning them or not mentioning them. But uh, obviously, you know, we've got uh, a lot of the uh, governors and former governors out there. Uh, well, tick, are, tick through the, what you see the field is. The, what well, you, think I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously Governor Romney, uh, Governor Paul Lenti, uh, Governor Palin, whether or not uh, Governor uh, Barber or Governor Daniels get in. Uh, but a lot of uh, talk about them uh, out of the Senate, uh, you know, Senator uh, Thune, maybe Senator uh, DeMint, um, former Speaker uh, Gingrich, former Senator Santorum. I mean, there's a, you know, uh, I think a big field is good for Republicans. Uh, and, and there, you know, there could be folks who get elected now who could all of a sudden, you know, be in play uh, in, in this November. We have a very interesting field of governors uh, getting elected. I wouldn't encourage any of them to get elected governor of your state and then say, I'm going to run for president. Yeah. But, you know, I think like, there'll be a lot is, of new faces. Who is a, a dark horse people. like that? Who's on that list? Who's that? Who would you Well, want? I mean, I think when you, when you look at, uh, I mean, uh, you know, some of the, I mean, we're going to have, uh, you know, some, uh, some uh, in, in women governors that I think, you know, naturally could end up on a, on a short list. I mean, if, uh, for vice president, certainly. Um, so I, I don't know, I, you know, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, you know, who's running in, in a, you know, to get elected governor somewhere and then I'm throwing out their name for, uh, but I just, all I'm saying is it's a very fluid situation on the Republican side and I think the party is at a point in time where very open to new ideas, new faces, new energy, uh, and, and I think that's good for us. That'll, that'll be, uh, that'll be helpful. Now, one candidate on your side who's gotten a lot of attention is Christine O'Donnell, the Republican nominee in Delaware. Mm -hmm. What do you make of her? I think that she is a clear reflection of uh, people's desire for change, uh, people's uh, in the Republican primary, you know, shaking things up. Uh, I hope she wins. Uh, I know the poll numbers show that, uh, that uh, Governor Castle, former Congressman Castle, had been our nominee. Chances were better for Delaware. I don't dispute that, but I would also say 
uh, that uh, I don't count that seat out at all. And I think that, uh, that Christine O'Donnell has been pretty effective of late and that, uh, you know, it, it's, look, it's, there's, like I say, there's no such thing as a safe Democratic seat in this election year. So how, how damaging do you think those video clips have been of her? You know, I, I, I'm not sure. It's, this environment is such where someone who's out there with a very clear, resonant message that if you send me to Washington, I'm going to you know, put the brakes on spending. I'm going to make sure we don't raise taxes. I'm going to try and get control out of, of this out of control uh, debt. I think that you know, gets heard you know, over and above uh, you know, 20 year old tapes about witchcraft. I really do. Okay. All right, as we say goodbye here, David Axelrod told us about his iPad. What is your toy these days, Eddie? Well, I have an iPad, I have to say, but I haven't, uh, I haven't learned it yet. Uh, but I, my, my, learned it. my goal it is uh, <laughs> I, I, how to turn it on, for one thing. So. The Google. <laughs> the Google. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping to, to get a chance to, to learn that here when I go but, on my but next what are, what are your devices? Like, where do you, what do you use to get news? Uh, I use, uh, I go on, I just use my laptop and, and my uh, BlackBerry. Uh, that's pretty much it. And where do you go for news these days? Uh, well, uh, certainly I go to, to Google and Politico. Uh, yeah, but what's, what's I, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, NRO and uh, the Daily Caller and uh, uh, on the other side, HuffPost, and, and uh, um, you know, check out what's going on on the cost and, you know, like to see, because I, I like to read what's, what's in the Daily Cost today, because I like to know what's going to be in the New York Times tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Ed Gillespie, thank you very much for sitting down with us, taking a break from your board meeting. Thank you. <laughs> it's a nice zinger there, Ed. Mike Allen, Ed Gillespie, thank you both.